Hi everyone, Dr. Whitney Coster is here to talk to you about the argument analysis essay which you've been assigned to work on. Now I have been preparing you for this assignment with lectures on critical thinking, rhetoric, logical fallacies, and the rhetorical analyses that I've done on the print ad and Orwell's shooting an elephant. So if you haven't watched those yet, please be sure that you do and you might even want to consider reviewing them before you get started on this assignment. Now, I don't have a student example for you, unfortunately, but I have posted lectures on basic writing tips and how to do a peer review, and you're certainly welcome and encouraged to watch my lectures on how to write a thesis statement and the rhetorical analysis that I do on Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, um, both of which are linked below. Now, these are not required of you, but I know that learning online can be a little challenging sometimes, so I want to provide you with as many resources as possible. And I think that these lectures would be beneficial for you, not just for this project, but for the final project that we'll do in this class as well. For this assignment, you're going to submit three separate documents, a first draft, a peer review, and a final draft. Keep in mind that the first draft will be a shitty first draft compared to your more polished final draft, and that's totally fine. The first draft is a really low stakes component of this project because all you have to do to earn the 100 points that it's worth is simply do it. If you fulfill the requirements of the draft and turn it in on time, then you earn 10% of your final course grade. Super easy. With that said, though, let me be emphatic about the fact that it's very important that you submit the first draft on time, and here's why. If you don't turn it in on time, you not only lose the 100 points that it's worth, but then you become ineligible to write and receive a peer review. That means that you lose out on earning the 50 points that the peer review is worth, and you don't get that crucial feedback that you're going to need in order to revise your first draft into a solid final draft. A general rule of thumb for college life, I mean life in general really, is to submit your work early enough to be able to troubleshoot any potential problems that you're definitely going to have at one point or another, like printer problems, computer crash, unsafe files, being unable to log into Canvas, dog at your homework kind of stuff. You know, life. Now, when you submit your first draft, Canvas is going to assign you a peer review partner automatically. It will not assign partners to those who submit their work late or don't submit anything at all. And Canvas is not an empathetic person. It is a software that is programmed to know that anything submitted after the cutoff time and date is late, and so it will mark it as such and not assign you a partner. That means that you cannot submit your work late, even by a second. Now, you will not be notified of who your peer review partner is until the morning after the assignment is due. So don't worry that you can't see that information right away because you shouldn't be able to. However, by the following morning, you should be able to see it as long as you are accessing Canvas through a desktop and not the mobile app. Um, for some reason, you're unable to see this information using the mobile app, so just be sure that you are on a computer whenever you are accessing this information. Now, you only have one day to finish the peer review. I'm actually giving you more time to complete it than you would have if we were meeting in person. Normally, when I meet with students in person, the students come to class with their first draft, they find someone to work with, they exchange papers, they do the peer review right there in class, and then they go home with their feedback and they start revising their first draft into that final draft. Obviously, we are not doing that, but just know that you have significantly more time to complete the peer review. So I expect a lot from you guys. I want them to be really, really good and thorough. Um, however, with that is said, I mean, the peer review is due pretty quickly after the first draft is submitted, so be mindful of that. That means that if you have any trouble locating your peer review partner or any problems at all, you need to contact me immediately so that we can troubleshoot. I've had students who reach out like two hours before the peer review is due or even after it's due, and I mean, obviously that just doesn't work. If you miss the peer review, unfortunately, you miss it. Now, please keep in mind that if for some reason you unfortunately don't receive a peer review from your partner, you know, maybe they forgot or they just dropped the ball or whatever, it doesn't give you the right not to turn in a final draft. I've had students in the past say, well, I didn't turn my final draft in because I never received a peer review. That does not matter. Um, if you don't get one, let me know. We can talk about some options for you, but just know that you are still accountable for turning a final draft in on time. Also, when you write the peer review, you will either need to attach it in the comment section box or just type it out in that comment section box itself. But note that if you just attach the peer review, you have to type something in the comment section for Canvas to recognize that you actually did the peer review. 
you can just type something like see attached document for peer review if you want. Once you write something in that box, the X should change to a check mark indicating that the peer review is complete, um, at least you know by Canvas. Once you receive the peer review that your partner wrote for you, you can start working on your final draft. For either of the drafts, I highly, highly encourage you to take advantage of the writing lab in the tutoring center. I mean, why not get free extra feedback on your essay from trained scholars and instructors? It certainly never hurts. Formatting requirements are all listed on the prompt, but I'm going to briefly go over them here. Your essay must be written in MLA style. It must be double spaced and typed in Times New Roman with 12 point font and one inch margins. You will need to manually adjust some of these things like the margins and some of the double spacing. I'm not sure why, but Word tends to add extra spaces between paragraphs or between like, you know, the heading and the title, for instance. So you've just got to go in and fix those spots yourself. Um, you also must include a works cited page, which includes the proper citation of your text and other text that you may use for research purposes, though you're not required to do any additional outside research for this assignment. And a very important point is that the essay must be at minimum four full pages, not including the works cited page. You may go over the four page limit if necessary, but you may not go under. Be mindful of these formatting requirements because as a writing class, it's really important to know how to properly format in MLA, and doing this is a major way to earn all 100 points for the first draft. So now that we've gotten all the logistics out of the way, let's talk about what you actually have to do for this project. For this assignment, you're going to visit the database Opposing Viewpoints on the library's website. And on the prompt, I've given you the link to this database, but you can also just go to the library's website, um, click on Databases A to Z, and then click on O for Opposing Viewpoints. This database is really cool and useful, even outside of academia. Um, it basically takes trending topics, global, political, and social issues, you know, things that you're already interested in, and provides opposing viewpoints on these issues so that you may form your best stance or opinion on them. Take the time to really search through this database. You're welcome to browse through featured topics or search for a specific one that you are particularly interested in. It doesn't matter. Just make sure that it's a text on opposing viewpoints that you would like to analyze. And remember that a text is not just a book with words in it. It's anything that is readable for an intended audience. So you have a wide range of options from which to choose on this database, including videos, stories, press conferences, news articles, books, essays, etc. And remember, you're only choosing one text, which will focus on a topic from one point of view. You're not discussing the topic from both sides. Once you've selected your text, your job is to identify and thoroughly analyze how the writer argues his or her thesis or the primary argument on the topic. I would say that it's imperative to explicitly mention what the writer's thesis is in your essay so that you can start to analyze how it's argued. Once you identify the argument, I want you to discuss and analyze the argument strategies that the writer uses to present the thesis. And you can do this by answering the questions that I've listed on the prompt in which I will go over right now. In order to analyze the writer's argument, you must consider rhetorical purpose. That means that you need to discuss how the writer's argument is impacted by genre, target audience, and purpose. So in other words, is the genre appropriate for the type of argument being presented? For instance, you might take the argument a bit more seriously if it were presented in an academic essay versus a personal blog, or vice versa, depending on the topic and purpose of the argument. And that brings me to question two. What is the writer's purpose in trying to argue this point? Are they trying to incite you to take action on the matter, inform you of something that you don't know, motivate you to change your stance on it? And how are you able to determine this? For every question, demonstrate to the reader how you analyze the text. Remember that analysis and critical reading are really just the process of breaking things down, examining them closely, and seeing how they all work together. So consider everything from dialogue, rhetoric, quotes, images, language, tone, voice, expressions, references to resources, descriptions, grammar, if and how the writer establishes a relationship with the reader, etc. And speaking of the reader, that brings me to question three. To whom exactly is the writer directing their argument? Focus on the writer's intended audience, that group of people that they had in mind when composing this text. 
and ask yourself if they present their argument in language and rhetoric that are most appropriate for this target audience. Is the writer speaking to a resistant or a receptive audience? Do they use a respectful tone? And what do they assume about this group of people? Question four asks you how the writer uses ethos or credibility and pathos or emotion to introduce, support, and or further their argument. When someone is presenting an argument, it's important to ask who this person even is, what sort of resources they're using to support their claim, and how they go about presenting their argument. If they are you know, highly emotional, meaning that they overuse pathos, you're more likely to question them and their argument, right? Just think about any time that you've ever um, you know, argued with someone who uses emotion over logic to support their claim. Hopefully you will find far more logos in your text than pathos, and question five focuses on just that. Remember that an argument is a claim that is supported with logical and reasonable evidence, so logos is especially important here. Some ways to identify logos in the text is to see if the writer presents his or her argument through cause and effects, um, if the writer compares and contrasts, defines and classifies, narrates a series of events, generalizes from particulars, provides relevant examples and analogies, and or relies on expert opinion. And with that said, question six asks you to be on the lookout for logical fallacies, which is the opposite of logos. Remember, logical fallacies are arguments that rely on faulty or illogical reasoning. Hopefully you don't find any in the text that you're examining, but they're unfortunately used more often than not, so it wouldn't be surprising if you encountered one or two. Question seven asks you to consider some of the rhetorical strategies the writer uses to articulate the argument. Look for common rhetorical devices like metaphors, irony, sarcasm, similes, alliteration, hyperbole, personification, euphemism, allusion, etc. And consider how these devices are intended to impact the argument. And last but not least, question eight asks you if the writer acknowledges counter arguments to their argument. It's important that they just acknowledge and not just go on and on about them. Um, I mean, the writer needs to call attention to them, but shouldn't spend too much time on them because they should be focused more on their argument and explaining why their argument is more compelling and stronger. By considering all of these questions, you will learn how to become a more mindful thinker and reader of all the texts and arguments that inundate us on a daily basis. Truly, once you get a handle on how to examine different argument strategies, you'll be able to apply these tools to any argument that you hear, whether it be from a politician, a healthcare provider, your parents, a friend, or even yourself. Yes, we definitely present arguments to ourselves more often than we realize. Additionally, I would say that a major problem that we contend with more than perhaps any generation before us is widespread misinformation. We need to be concerned with and conscious of how information and arguments are presented these days and how we kind of sift through it all to recognize truth and facts from distorted untruths and rumors. Keep in mind that practically everyone has some form of social media and therefore has their own public platform or soapbox on which to argue about politics, world events, their beliefs, and their understanding of major issues that are going on every single day. So it's incredibly easy to forward and share one person's argument to thousands if not millions of people with the click of a button. And this is how we sometimes find ourselves in the mire of misinformation that's being argued through memes, posts, articles, TikTok, you name it. You can protect yourself from these kinds of things by engaging in critical and careful reading and knowing how to analyze argument strategies on the things that confront us on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the most important warnings that I can give you about this assignment is to make sure that you don't make the mistake of simply writing about the topic that your chosen text discusses. So for instance, if the text that you're doing an argument analysis on discusses COVID-19 as its topic, your essay should not discuss COVID-19, its history, where you stand on the matter, etc. Your essay must be an analysis of the way the writer argues his or her point on COVID-19. So don't lose sight of the objective of this assignment. In four pages, full pages, not three and three quarter pages, four full pages, you have to address all the questions on the prompt. Of course, some of these questions may not be relevant to your text, or you may be unable to find certain elements in your text. So for example, if you are unable to locate a counter argument in the text, acknowledge that by saying that the writer does not include a counter argument, and this affects the argument in that it does X, Y, and Z. 
Or maybe, and hopefully, the writer does not include, um, include any logical fallacies. If that's the case, you can write, the writer's logic is sound and avoids logical fallacies. Basically, just be sure to address all the questions substantially. Do your best to include as much detail and supporting evidence as possible. I would say that this is the one thing that students tend to gloss over a bit and it can be detrimental to the final grade. Here are some suggestions and advice for the essay. You need to treat it as a scholarly professional piece of prose because that's what it is. So don't just number the questions and answer them separately as bullet points. This is a formal, unified, and coherent essay that will need to be built on solid transitions. Remember not to use the personal I or the second person you in your essay, and make sure that you focus on each question very, very thoroughly, as I said before multiple times. Um, this one is just really, really important, so I want to be emphatic about it. Remember that I am here if you need help, as is the tutoring lab, so be sure to reach out to them or me for extra feedback and try to do it as early as possible because I do know that the lab fills up pretty quickly. Please be sure to read through the prompt very carefully. It is posted on Canvas for you with logistical information like due dates, formatting, and of course the questions that I went over with you. Um, let me know if you have any questions and I wish you guys the very, very best on this essay.